Very cool. Really excited that you guys are here. Um, it seems like a really uh, interesting group, um, and hopefully we build some cool stuff today. Uh, so I, I have like um, probably around an hour to an hour and a half um, of kind of just like background of uh, extensions, like maybe why we why we uh, added that to Dynamo and how we started uh, started using them and started refactoring some of Dynamo to, to actually use the extensions instead of developing more core functionality. Um, and and then I'm gonna just go through some of the APIs for that. Um, and then uh, I think the rest of the day will be kind of you building, you know, whatever you're interested in building for the day. And we could talk about, you know, if, if um, you didn't come ready, like, or loaded with an idea, we can talk about uh, different ideas, share some some different ideas between people. <clears throat> and then I think the plan is we can kind of come around. Yeah, so one thing that is not on this schedule, but it is on the printed out sheet, is at 5 o'clock there will be something that we do at Grimshaw every week, which is called Friday at 5. So you guys are all invited to join us. It's in the atrium at the front. And Russell and Luke will give us a kind of insight into how they work internally at Autodesk. And the rest of the office will also join us for that presentation. So feel free to join us. Luke, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Close enough. I was thinking of four, four letter here, so. words. Um, right, and then we'll we'll just get into, you know, I figure um, the autodeskers here can kind of go around and we can help you work on whatever you're working on if you're in groups or, you know, working on some uh, kind of extension solo. So um, so I titled this thing um, Super Powered uh, Dynamo uh, and then with a quote from Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. I don't know if, if that uh, plays here as well as in the U.S., but with great power comes great responsibility. Probably quoted somewhere else before that. Um, so that's just something I'm going to try to reiterate through this uh, content is just that you essentially, when you're building an extension, you have uh, kind of application level access to the APIs, which you don't have, which by design you don't have from like a zero touch node. Um, if I would imagine most of you are familiar with zero touch nodes, but that's where you can import uh, a node just using C sharp and, uh, or any kind of .NET compiled code. Um, <clears throat> And it's kind of by design that you don't have access to some of these application level APIs, and you do in an extension. Um, and so it's very easy or potential uh, to write two extensions which interact with each other in ways that make the experience for people using Dynamo very bad. Um, what if, you know, if those two extensions do very different things to the same data or something like that? So it's uh, important to consider that and consider what people are going to install. But I'll, I'll just be going through that a couple times in, in different places where that'll come up. Um, but I think it's important enough to make it the subtitle. Uh, so where extensions fit into the kind of Dynamo uh, ecosystem of uh, hackability or extensibility, um, this is a, actually a, uh, this is a Luke original um, that I amended with the extensions uh, bit that we added. So, you know, uh, this, this graph is, is kind of showing the uh, the expressive power of different interactions with Dynamo that you can use through the uh, either through UI or through code, and the, the expressive power you get versus the difficulty of implementing them. So, you know, at the bottom of this graph is the in just using Dynamo itself, using the UI, adding notes, the canvas throughout of the box, um, and then a little bit higher than that, you've got custom nodes kind of overlapping with design script or code blocks. Um, so that's things you can also use through the UI, but you can build up more complex. Uh, you know, complex graphs and complex uh, functionality that way without really leaving the application. Um, and then there's another step up in, in difficulty and expressiveness with zero touch. Um, and then after that, if any of you are familiar with kind of like UI nodes or node model <coughs> uh, nodes, you know that they are a big ramp up in difficulty, um, require some like computer science concepts that are not um, you know, it, it, it's common in computer science, not, not a very common um, kind of uh, set of, of knowledge in our AEC. And so just even explaining that concept um, or teaching it to your coworkers it, is pretty difficult. Um, and even for people on the Dynamo team to implement some of those nodes is, is kind of tricky. Um, so 
Uh, and then one step above that, there's host integration, which is something like Dynamo Revit or Dynamo for Maya or Dynamo for you know Rhino, or whatever it might be. Some something one level above that even, uh, where you're actually calling these core uh, APIs. Is it sorry to interrupt? Is it normal for the UI to be that complex, or is it just the, the implementation of Dynamo is complex? It, uh, we can talk specifically about that. Um, <coughs> Uh, in more detail definitely later, but the, the one of the reasons it's hard in Dynamo is because like Luke was saying yesterday We have this we have design script uh, and the whole graph compiles down to that and essentially when you are uh, writing a UI node you You have to know how your UI binds to the AST and we could probably do a better job of like Auto binding somehow through zero touch nodes or through some kind of zero touch like thing um, But the way that it's implemented right now is you have to know that you are really generating an AST. You have to know what that node uh, becomes when it gets compiled into Design Script. So you have to know WPF if you're going to write a UI node, and then you need to know the Design Script AST uh, builder at the same time. So it's difficult. Um, it's difficult for us. It's difficult for you. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so I think a lot of the things that people want to do with UI nodes prop might be able to be done with extensions, and that's interesting because you don't need to know about ASTs. Um, or the design script syntax. So, you so extensions are somewhere I think between zero touch. Uh, they have a lot of expressive power, um, and they don't require uh, knowing about some of these. Um, depending on what you're doing, you don't you may not need to know about the AST or kind of the design script virtual machine. Hopefully, um, and so you can just use you know WPF C sharp stuff. So trying to think about when to use an extension. When would you want to use an extension? You know, as opposed to these other uh, these other kind of extensibility um, mechanisms. So when you want control over the graph itself, like when you want to uh, add or remove nodes or notes or do some like meta um, some meta programming, essentially, right? You want to generate a program. You want to you want your extension to generate a, a Dynamo program or Design Script program. Um, the way that you know one of the reasons that zero touch nodes were designed. Uh, to, so that they don't have access to the rest of the graph is because it would be, you know, as a, as a design decision, it would be odd if a node in, uh, a piece of code in, in your graph just started, you know, removing other nodes, if, if it, that is like a privileged node. I mean, there's, there's another reason, which is we want to be able to have, uh, we wanted to make the uh, C-sharp as, as simple to import as possible, like the whole zero touch concept, try to sprinkle in as few Dynamo-centric APIs as possible and still have the C-sharp import and turn into zero-touch nodes. Um, so when you want control over the graph, an extension uh, kind of signals that. So if someone installs an extension, it, it might be more obvious, like this thing has more power than a, just a package, potentially, or just a package with zero-touch nodes in it, or, or custom nodes, or, or Python nodes, or something. Um, if you want to add uh, UI or functionality that's external to a single node, which is kind of the same, uh, the same idea. But if you want some some UI that doesn't just live on the node itself in the graph, but maybe a separate window, a separate viewer, something like that. <clears throat> so another good one uh, is core functionality that needs uh, improvement for us. Um, so we started uh, when we first added the extensions uh, framework to Dynamo to. Uh, factor out some stuff. So the, actually, the package manager is an extension. Um, the, the the not the view portion of it that still hasn't been pulled out and made into like a view extension, but the the um, model layer of the package manager is an extension that gets loaded through the extensions framework. Um, there's also some the new library UI uh, is an extension, is a view extension. So it's uh, not part of the core. It gets loaded as a separate uh, uh, piece and added. Um, the same with, uh, there's a couple other small pieces of UI function, uh, functionality that were added that way. Um, and so if someone wanted to do a pull request to, to Dynamo but didn't want to, you know, didn't want to modify the Dynamo core, didn't want to mess with uh, having to know about all this other, you know, all the other functionality in there and worry about breaking th things there, um, one way to do it and one way that we're going to try to add functionality going forward is using extensions. Um, so. Uh, that's, you know, that maybe that would uh, open up more contributions from external parties, which is something we're really interested in. Um, and like I was saying before, maybe you don't feel like learning about abstract syntax trees today. It's just not, it's just not the day.
that you want to get into that. Um, so what can we do with them? Um, so um, so you can create an instance of your extension when uh, Dynamo starts. It's kind of like um, you get some callbacks that let you know that the extension that Dynamo started or Dynamo's finished loading or what you know some life cycle events um, that we'll go over. And then you could add menu items to the Dynamo window pretty simply, so you can add your own, uh, you know, uh, menu item inside of the view or or uh, settings uh, menu item that would open up your if you had a, a, a command you wanted to run or a window you wanted to open up. Um, you can get a reference to the current workspace, which is something that I think we get requests for from zero touch nodes a lot. Uh, which is I want to get I want to be able to access the current workspace and do get some information like where is the file path to this thing or um, can I get an event when a node gets added or something like that or a connector gets added or some modification happens so if you have a reference to this uh, current workspace you can do a lot the the API for that object is um, ha has a lot of uh, functionality on it you can also uh, execute model commands on the Dynamo model. So I'll go into some examples of this, but this is this is essentially how the um, UI interaction in, in Dynamo is done. So there's these uh, these commands that you can run uh, that you can execute against the model or against the view model layers of Dynamo and do things like add a node, um, and then it will uh, you won't just add a node. You'll also add some uh, state to the undo reader recorder. So this is you can you can do kind of uh, pre-baked functionality that we let people do through the UI and you can execute that functionality from your extension. So if there's something you know that Dynamo can do and you want to take advantage of that, there's probably a command that you can find which will do it. So for instance, like zooming to a specific node, that's like something we have a command for or saving or saving as and opening the dialog box if the file is not saved. So there's these different levels of commands and uh, parameters you can pass to them. Um, you could get a reference to the Dynamo view, um, which is like the t whole window, and then you have as much control uh, as Dynamo Sandbox or Dynamo Revit or something. So you essentially have like application level control. Um, and that's not, that that's good and bad um, from a, from like a permissions uh, point of view. Um, so that's kind of the coming back to the responsibility uh, aspect of like what you end up doing with how uh, how much you end up affecting some users experience using Dynamo and I can show you how to kind of get into that so the but the architecture just from like a uh, from building an extension uh, is just the there's there's two parts um, so one is a .NET assembly uh, that contains a class um, which implements these two, uh, either one of these two uh, interfaces, um, either an iView extension or an i extension, um, and then there's some uh, methods that you'll implement as part of those interfaces, and they're they're pretty simple. Um, I think there's they I think I believe they both have a dispose method, um, a startup method, loaded, shutdown, some unique ID, um, and this sample is a little bit funny that it returns a different unique ID, probably you would want to return a static ID um, uh, because you, you may not want to, I don't think, I think our system doesn't want to load two of the same uh, extensions at this point. Um, so it, it depends how you set this up. You, you could set it up so that someone could actually load two of your extensions at the same time, two instances of your extension, but that, that has to do with how you uh, set up the unique ID. If you make a new random GUID like this each time, then um, you could potentially like load many of these extensions if there's a reason that you wanted to do that. Um, and then some name, which will show up in the log. Um, so users would know that this extension got loaded at this time and got unloaded at this other time. It'll show up in the console. Um, and the other part is kind of like, if you're familiar with Revit add-ins, very similar, there's like a manifest, um, <clears throat> which is just an XML file, um, which has some uh, either a view extension definition element or an extension definition element. So there's, you know, it's pretty simple in here. There, either this is a view extension definition or extension definition, uh, some assembly path that points to where the DLL actually lives. Um, 
and this where it lives is uh, you know is wherever you end up putting it because right now you'd kind of have to manually install the extension which is something that we're working on um, or write an installer or move it somewhere um, and then the type name uh, element which is what namespace and class uh, Dynamo is going to create so it's going to create an instance of that extension so this is the notifications extension that's in Dynamo just a tiny little bit of UI around displaying notifications and this is the just taken from the Dynamo source um, so it points to that it points back to the Dynamo uh, like Dynamo main installation folder which is just so it's a relative path to that DLL and then it tells Dynamo to instantiate uh, the Dynamo notifications notifications view extension when uh, that this extension gets loaded so inside of the Dynamo folder there's these two uh, subfolders extensions or uh, view extensions and the naming of the this manifest file is important so it's whatever your extension name is um, underscore um, ex extension uh, definition.xml or view extension definition.xml so this is actually I think I, I left off the definition bit um, so even though naming is important this is wrong pretty sure it's extension definition capital D um, and you can look if you look in the Dynamo folder you'll see the extensions that we already load and you can just follow the naming convention there So it will, um, if it finds, at Dynamo's startup, it'll look in these two folders. Um, and if it finds uh, any extension uh, definition XMLs, it'll then go and just instantiate those types. So uh, before I get into um, this, I'm curious, just does anyone have any experience with uh, MVVM kind of patterns? Um, or what that stuff means. So, uh, so model uh, view model um, uh, architecture is a pretty common pattern when using WPF, uh, Windows Presentation Foundation, to build UI in, in .NET. And um, we've kind of followed that. I mean, we have a we we you know have have a a pretty complicated uh, code base at this point, but that's the kind of pattern we've tried to follow. And so there's a, if anyone's looked at the Dynamo repo, which I hope <coughs> some of you have built at this point and have working, um, that's not totally necessary, but if we're gonna use the, if we're gonna use the Dynamo samples uh, repo to get started and just wanna make sure that we're aligned between like uh, the version of the samples repo and the version of Dynamo uh, that we're running. So you could run against um, uh, Dynamo you know, installed version of Dynamo or something. You can add your extension there, but I just uh, just want to make sure we're using the same version of the samples and the same version of, of Dynamo. But uh, sorry, but anyway, if if you've looked at that repo, there's this Dynamo Core project, which essentially is like all the core APIs. There's libraries, which is our nodes mostly, and then there's Dynamo Core WPF, which is the UI, the WPF UI. So. Um, there's a big split, and we try to maintain the split between the model layer and the WPF layer. So nothing in the Dynamo core has any dependencies on on WPF. So it'll build without it'll build on Mac or Linux or whatever through Mono, um, which is important. So you could you know you can deploy Dynamo potentially on Mac without a UI, um, and that's because like this effort was made to keep these WPF references out, um, and that's kind of it's important to note because we're you could also do the same thing with your extension. Right, so if somehow you end up deploying Dynamo on Mac or Linux or something, um, or we end up deploying it on Mac or Linux at some point, and you want your extension to work, um, you may want to not write a view extension. You might want to just write a regular extension that has no references to WPF, um, and then that could be deployed and run without a UI uh, if you know if you were writing an extension that was useful that way. So um, the the extensions architecture. That's why there's extensions and view extensions, and they're split um, in that way. So the kind of just like this is this is just an, an overview of Dynamo, not really thinking about the extension uh, extensions bit yet. But the the top part in blue is our you know kind of Dynamo WPF UI, in, which is inside of the Dynamo Core WPF DLL, um, and that essentially communicates with the model uh, 
via these recordable commands. Um, then there's some graph representation, which is that workspace model, which you can get a reference to through the through extensions. And there's a uh, and that holds node models and connector models. Um, and then once we get past this point, these other boxes here are essentially the the design script virtual machine and a way for the design script virtual machine to import uh, foreign code. This FFI, um, which is the a foreign function interface. But this is not as important to know. It's just uh, the model layer has all of these bits in it so that it can run without the UI. And one thing that you get out of this kind of architecture is you could write a totally different UI for Dynamo and still have the underlying model stay the same. So you could have and you could have multiple UIs run at the same time. So you could you could essentially write an extension that looks at the model and is a totally different graph editor um, or a totally different view of that same data and you could run them at the same time. You could have like five view extensions that all are showing different representations of the, of the model. Okay, so um, that's kind of just a, an overview for this next slide, which is where these lifecycle events get called. So um, there's, there's two important ones. There's also shutdown, um, but the, the kind of two important ones for just getting started um, and getting, getting something up and running are startup and loaded. Um, and so at startup, uh, Dynamo is going to call these two methods. And either the Dynamo model or the Dynamo view is going to call the methods, depending if it's an uh, extension or a view extension. So uh, Dynamo model starts up, inst uh, extensions get inst instantiated, and then, um, then startup gets called on those extensions. So this is uh, that Dynamo model has just started. Um, it may not be ready for interaction yet. The user might not be able to do anything, but the, the model is built. Um, and then uh, loaded will get called. And there's interesting parameters that get passed to both of these things, which I'll go into. But this is just the, the you know, life cycle. And then uh, after that, the view extensions get instantiated. Startup gets called on them loaded gets called on them when it's ready for interaction. So when loaded gets called on the view extensions, that's like Dynamo model's ready, Dynamo view is ready, the user can actually do things now. Um, and then at some point in the future, shutdown is going to get called on the view, and then shutdown will get called on the model uh, extensions. Like when, if someone unloads an extension somehow, which they can't do right now, but it's possible that in the future we would have some way for them to unload an extension at runtime. So those will get called, or if Dynamo is shutting down, these will get called. So important takeaway, startup, then load. Okay, so this just kind of goes back to what I was saying before. One of the, I was talking with uh, Peter, who's the, the developer who kind of um, pushed for extensions, built the extensions framework, and started pulling stuff out of Dynamo and putting them into, um, into the extensions manager. And one you know, important point that he had was that view extensions um, can, they have reference to the extensions manager, actually. Um, and the reason for that is so that you can build extensions which reference other, you can build view extensions which reference other model layer extensions. So you could potentially build view extensions, uh, you can build a model extension which builds some kind of data, and then you can build views for that which you compose. So it, an interesting possibility is to build multiple view extensions which reference one piece, you know, one set of data and then let you build multiple views of that. Um, just kind of going back, you could do the same thing with, with the Dynamo model, um, just taking advantage of, of MVVM for that and the separation between WPF and, and the core. Um, so this is looking more at like what is actually in these startup and loaded params and this is these are the kind of, like, what can you do uh, with the APIs in Dynamo? Because besides being like a, you know, a workshop on extensions, this is, to do anything with the extensions that's interesting, besides just like loading another application that sits there and does nothing with Dynamo, you kind of need to know about the Dynamo core APIs. And like, I'm calling them APIs, but really this is probably the first time we've ever talked to anybody about using Dynamo models APIs to do anything interesting. So it will be like, I'm going to go over what these do, and it's really interesting to see, like, when you try to build things, what's missing, and you know, 
I think that will, that will be like really good for our team. So that um, I don't think we've ever like had a slide with these things on them. That's like externally facing before. So um, you know, it's about extensions, but it's really about the APIs that we've got um, and what can you do with them as an external user? Because uh, that's different than like what we can do internally, and you know, we uh, know about them, and we also do some magic stuff to you know, get around some of the, the things we put in place. So, um, but just to, just to go through some of these at a high level. Um, so, uh, ready, uh, let's see. So, ready params and startup params are like the, uh, so the, the top two um, mm -hmm. sets of boxes are the model layer. Um, so, this is what you get as a, uh, let's see, this is, these are like what you get as a, um, a model extension. Um, so you would get access to, uh, you know, the um, at startup you would get access to the auth provider, which is essentially like if you're in Revit um, and you log in through Revit, you can tell that you're logged in. Um, so, for instance, like if you're using Package Manager uh, and you start up Dynamo Sandbox, you can't upload anything because Dynamo Sandbox doesn't have an auth provider. So if for some reason you need to know that the user's logged in uh, to some kind of Autodesk service, um, you can use this auth provider. I'm not sure what exactly uh, you would use that for, but you could use it to, as some kind of login uh, access control mechanism that kind of relies on our ability to log in. Um, preferences is like all the Dynamo uh, preference settings. Um, you can read those and access those. Path manager, you can get to really interesting uh, kind of locations that are loaded at Dynamo Startup. So this is things like where what's a nodes directory where all the DLLs uh, UI nodes live. What's all the package path directory? So you can find all the other packages and potentially do something horrible with that. Um, so just like you have a lot of access, the the library loader is pretty interesting. So you can load other libraries at runtime. So you could start up and you can uh, import another DLL as a zero touch package from your extension. Um, you can import design script files. Um, I think the library loader, you can look at like all the loaded functions that are currently loaded into the VM, things like that. Uh, custom node manager, you have access to like all the loaded custom nodes. You could create custom nodes at runtime. You could like build a custom node at runtime in memory and then like inject it. Um, so if you wanted to like construct and then have you, you know, have it show up in the library. And the Dynamo version is just string Dynamo version of the, the engine number. Um, and then like v, the view extension only adds one thing at this point, which is the extensions manager. So from a view extension at startup, you can get to all the other extensions. Um, so you could do that composition. Or you could do other things like load other extensions potentially. Um, and then the ready params, so these ones on the left, actually, these are the ones that get called second, like when, when interaction is ready. So here you have access to like all the workspace models that are currently uh, loaded and the current workspace model. So you can get access to the workspace model that um, the user is currently looking at. And this is probably, probably the starting point, of, I think, of a lot of uh, work. And the API for workspace model is kind of crazy. Um, it's probably too big. There's probably too many public methods on it, um, but maybe we're totally missing something. So it'd be pretty interesting to see like what you guys want to do with that. Um, the command executive is an object which lets you run these commands that I talked about before, and I've got some actual API samples of that that we can look at. Notification received is just an event that will trigger when a notification uh, from the notifications manager gets gets thrown. Not as interesting. Um, current workspace changed event is like uh, the user has switched workspaces. And then I'm going to really quickly go through these. But these, these are pretty interesting and pretty powerful. For in, a, in a view extension, when the view extension gets totally loaded, you've got access to the Dynamo menu, so you can add a new menu item so people can actually access your extension um, or you know pop, pop up a window or run some command or something. You also have access to the background preview, so that's the geometry viewer. So you could inject your own geometry views into that viewer. Um, you could totally replace it with another control. You can um, you know, do, do pretty interesting things to the background visualization. 
uh, there. You could change the colors. You, you can do a lot. You can, um, you know, potentially like totally uh, change that experience. Uh, render pa render package factory is like the an object which lets you inject geometry into the background. You like helps do that. Um, the Dynamo window is the Dynamo view. So I have a star next to it because <clears throat> there's some hacky stuff you can do to get access to everything here um, and just be in control of the application at that point. Uh, but, but remember the responsibility bit. Um, and then there's a view command executive. So you can run like view, view commands, um, add menu item, is just a, like a helper function, so you can inject menu items. And the selection collection changed is uh, an interaction uh, event, so that you can tell when someone has changed a selection in, in Dynamo. All, all pretty useful stuff. Um, and some of these are kind of wrappers around things that we have that you'll be able to find if you dive in through some of these other objects. But they're just things that we've figured are immediately are going to come up in kind of extension development. But I bet there's stuff that's missing here as well, and I would be really interested in feedback on APIs here if they're if you think they're too big, if there's you're missing stuff that you want to do. So, with all the stuff that I showed, you can make a lot happen. One thing that's not obvious is that the view loaded params dot Dynamo window, which is back here, this guy. Uh, it's data context, so if you're familiar with WPF, the data context is essentially like what this view gets bound to. And in MVVM, that's usually a view model. And here it is a view model, it's the Dynamo view model. And so from the Dynamo view model, you can, you can do a ton of things. And we don't expose the Dynamo view model. It, was it wasn't part of that API, like that top level API. And so I would say if you have to do this, uh, you know, you're doing something more complicated and it might change in the future. I mean, we, our extensions do this. Um, like the library does this and then gets access to the Dynamo view model and uh, is able to have you know, high levels of control because we needed it for that extension. Um, but it, maybe it's not the, the right starting point. But from here you can, if you look at the API for the Dynamo view model, there's a ton of things you can do. You can you know, get access to all parts of the application pretty much. So, I'm just going to kind of go through the, the steps um, <clears throat> for building the Dynamo samples repo um, and kind of go through what one of the sample extensions does. And hopefully, you know, either you guys have got the code already loaded um, or pulled down from GitHub at that link. Um, if not, it now might be a good time to, uh, to go through that. And I can, uh, I can throw this link in the... Um, in the Slack later, if, any, if anybody needs it. Um, but it's you can just go to Dynamo DS on GitHub, um, and then check out uh, the Dynamo samples repo. And then I would also recommend if you don't have Dynamo itself pulled down, that would be good uh, to pull down and build, unless you've got it installed and you're sure that you're already on 2.0. Because otherwise, you'll have a mismatch between the samples that you're building and the um, and the version of Dynamo. Did anyone uh, have any trouble building either of those, or not have, uh, didn't have time to do it? A little bit. So, so the samples last night, the Dynamo samples we put, um, it wouldn't build because it couldn't resolve the NuGet reference to the beta of NuGet tag. I don't know why. So I had to use the 1.3. Okay. The Interesting. Package. I don't know if it was meant to do that or not, but... Well, it was... I know it was I mean, updated, but potentially somebody, like... That would be hard to do on NuGet, though. I don't know. I, I switched to 1.3. And, and it worked. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, if, if you have... If someone has trouble building the master branch of Dynamo Samples uh, repo, then, like Radu said, you might want to pull the 1.3 branch, but then you'd also need to be running 1.3 Dynamo. So just keep that in mind. Um, they have to match whichever versions. What's up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just um, 
just why that is maybe. So, so the Dynamo samples repo has a bunch of references to NuGets that we upload of Dynamo Core. So you shouldn't need Dynamo to build that repo. Um, but apparently, Radu, you were saying the, the NuGet yeah. somehow disappeared. Well, it just, just can't find the, the, the one that was referenced in there. It's referenced in 2.0 beta 3.907, and I can't find the NuGet for that. So I can, we can come around and check that out. Maybe there's something. Maybe I can just like upload that or something like that. Or we can upload, or I can change the repo really quick. Send a PR to Jose. He'll merge. Um, but this is the the view extension sample that's in there. So I'm, I mean, if you if if you can't get it building now, or if, if there's some problem with the with the repo uh, building, we can fix that. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to go through kind of what the code in this repo for this sample specifically does. <coughs> um, and this thing is at uh, dynamo ds slash dynamo samples. And if you pull master, you're going to get uh, the dynamo 2.0 version of this. And if you pull, there's a 1.3 branch if you're running dynamo 1.3, um, which will, you know, those extensions that you build will be able to be imported into dynamo 1.3. So the extension that gets built in here is pretty simple. It opens up another uh, window and it tracks the current nodes that are in the graph, um, and then updates the list of them uh, when they get added or removed. So creating a sample WPF extension um, involves a couple steps, which is you know creating a new Visual Studio project reference some Dynamo uh, NuGets, implement an iView extension, add a menu item that lets you actually in, uh, in interact with that thing, and then uh, load it into Dynamo and move the files where they need to be to actually get uh, imported. Simple. So this is kind of the diagram of what, what, this, what the sample does, what this extension does. So there's Dynamo, there's a current workspace model, and then there's our view extension. Um, the view extension has reference to uh, the window, and the, the window has reference to this view model, and we build a reference between the view model and the current workspace model that is the, the nodes. So we're interested in what the active nodes are, um, and we'll build a binding with WPF, which will uh, kind of data bind between this view model we're going to build, uh, which is hooked up to the current workspace model's nodes, and then when that changes, we'll get some, uh, you know, WPF will see this data binding has changed, and then text will update in this window, which will show the, which will show, you know, the names of these nodes. Right. So the current workspace model, the diagram here almost looks like the the image here. Right. There's the current workspace model on the left the window and the view model of our extension on the right, and then there's some binding between them. We change the data in the workspace and we get an updated view on the right. And this is just you know a simple thing. We're seeing like text here, but it could be like an, a complex view of the same data. You could build a tree view or some kind of textual view of the, of the graph. So if you didn't want to pull Dynamo samples, let's say, and you want it to build a completely new uh, repo, or it's not building for some reason because I messed up the NuGets. Well, then, <laughs> but if you, or, or you know, you want to start a brand new extension, um, then you want to start a Visual Studio class library project, um, and you want to target .NET 4.5, uh, most likely, definitely minimum. Um, I don't think I've tested it with like 4.6 or 4.52. I'm pretty sure our samples are 4.5, so I would just recommend going with that unless you want to um, mess around and, and test the limits. Um, and then you want to reference uh, Dynamo Core WPF UI uh, NuGet. And probably the if you want to build on Dynamo 2, one of our latest beta NuGets. So um, you can get into this NuGet search thing if you're not familiar with Visual Studio. Um, if you right-click on your project, you can go to like manage NuGet uh, packages, and if someone's not familiar with that, we can I can come around and 
you know, get that hooked up. Um, or you can uh, check out the, I think it's in Tools, NuGet Package Manager Extension in Visual Studio um, is the place to start. And just search for Dynamo Core WPF UI and Dynamo Core. And I, I believe if you install Dynamo Core WPF UI 2. Dot whatever, blah, 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 latest, you know, pre release build of Dynamo that's up there, um, it'll install Dynamo Core also. So I think you just have to target the WPF stuff. Yeah, so right click project, uh, manage NuGet packages, and then browse, and then search for, the, for Dynamo Visual Programming. And then first step is implementing a class, a, pu a public class. Um, I, think, I believe it's gotta be public so we can create an instance of it uh, easily. And then for this, for this sample, we're gonna implement iView extension. So if it's an iView extension, it'll, it can get loaded as a view, as a view extension. Um, and you need these, you know, this dispose method, which where, is where you could unhook your kind of like view logic. Um, so for instance, like if the view, uh, if you had two view extensions um, and, you, and we give uh, users the ability to unload extensions uh, at runtime, you'd want to implement dispose and disconnect your like event handlers here or whatever, uh, you know, like um, unmanaged, uh, not .NET resources you're you're uh, opening up, so like just like a file handle or some, something that you need to dispose when this extension disappears. You should probably do it in the dispose method, um, and then you have <clears throat> startup. We're not going to uh, do anything with startup here. We're just going to look at the the loaded um, method, which, uh, if you recall, loaded happens when in a view extension. Loaded happens when the view is totally loaded. So this is like the the view is there the um, users' cursors on the screen and the canvas is like rendered. Um, <clears throat> so the things we're going to do here, which I'll show in the next slide, just but to get an overview, because um, it'll be like a big jump in code, is just add a menu item that lets users open a new window, and then when that menu item gets clicked, open the window, um, and then also create a model, some data representation that we want to bind to for the extension. Um, and then the window that we opened up will display that data in some way. So there's a couple steps happening in, in that chunk of code. So <clears throat> we are going to uh, build a another class, um, which is this sample window view model. And this is just the data, like the view model that's going to represent the data we're showing in that. And it's going to be a notification object, um, and it's going to implement iDisposable. So I believe notification object uh, uh, is going to have some of, uh, some of methods on it that you can raise property changes for WPF so that you can do binding. <clears throat> so that is more of a WPF thing, but we can, you know, depending on people's familiarity with that, we can get into that. We can talk more about WPF um, and how much of a joy it is to work with. Um, so one thing that... Uh, one thing we do here is save a reference to the these ready params. Um, so this is the kind of uh, these these are the essentially the loaded parameters that we talked about before, like all those properties that you could get when a view starts up, when a, a view extension starts up. So in the constructor for this thing, we save a reference to that because we're going to want it later, and then we have this other method. Uh, current workspace model nodes changed, and then we raise this. We call this raise property changed with nothing in it, so that'll just raise all property changes. But so we're not doing much in here yet. We're just essentially saving the parameters in in this um, thing, and you can see that the constructor for this thing takes that that whole big parameter, um, and then filling this out a little bit more. So <clears throat> we've got now we have up on top a public string. So this is actually what we're going to display in the UI. So we have this public string, active node types, and it's a property, because um, I think you can only do binding in WPF to uh, properties. So it's not a field of the class. It's a, it's a public property with a getter. Um, and it, you know, when it, when it runs, it does this function get node types, which uh, basically just builds a big string of all the node names in the graph. And so you can see that we are iterating over the ready parameters dot current workspace model dot nodes. So this lets you access 
the current workspace model the users got open um, and the nodes that are in that current graph. Um, and then we're just taking the node name. And you'll also probably, once you start looking at the APIs for node model here, realize there's a lot of stuff on node model. And we can talk about you know what those APIs do. But there, there's a ton of useful stuff you can do to each individual node. But this essentially just builds a big string of all the node names. Um, and then that's what gets returned from the active node types. Uh, and we added a little bit more to the constructor here for this view model. So it takes the parameters that get passed from the extension. So this is saving like access to all those uh, different extension parameters. And then we hook up two uh, events which trigger our change uh, event. So whenever we look at, again at the current workspace model from the ready params, and now we're looking at the node added and node removed uh, events. So whenever a node gets removed or added from the, from the model, we get this up update event, and then we go and we change this string of all the node names, right? So whenever the nodes in the graph change, we uh, calculate a new string of all their names and concatenate them all together. <clears throat> and then at the very end, we have it disposed, we unhook uh, these events. So this is kind of the a uh, really simple view of like what we're what we're doing here again is we've got this <clears throat> window, this extension window we're going to open up for our extension. It's going to be bound to this view model that we're building, this sample window view model thing. Um, it only has one data binding, which is active node types property, which is a public property on that view model. Um, and then uh, whenever the nodes recalculate in the graph, we um, or whenever whenever this event gets triggered. Uh, nodes added or removed, we do two things. We recalculate the nodes in the graph and generate this string, and then we raise a property change for active node types. Um, and that property change actually triggers the UI to update, and that's kind of a, that's a WPF, uh, WPF thing. Okay, and then we build some actual UI, uh, really simple, you know, control um, that yeah, and looking at XAML is always fun. Um, but a, a control that essentially just has a text block in it and draws, you know, uh, draws the string that we had. So it's all the names of the nodes um, in, a, in a grid with a text block in there. So <clears throat> you can add a new WPF user control to the project, um, and you want to use a, a WPF control. Um, and then we're going to bind this text in this text block uh, using active node types. And this means that the, <clears throat> the data context for this, I, I believe the data context for this, um, for this control is going to be that sample view extension. So we'll set that in the extension. Um, so this is just a binding to that property on the view model. Um, and if this is all totally foreign uh, to you, we can totally, you know, let, let's talk uh, more one-on-one -on -one about WPF, and, and I'm sure we can send some help people's way to get more familiar with this stuff. Um, but but essentially, this is. It, I mean, I, I figure most of you are at least a, a little bit familiar with WPF, but this is like XAML is like a markup language for drawing controls. It's kind of you could think about it kind of like a. Um, I mean, it's not like HTML really, but there's elements here, and you're building. Um, you know, you can fill in uh, properties like this of those objects, like setting. Essentially, this is you know going in in the back. This is calling a constructor for this text block object, and then setting a bunch of parameters on it, and building a binding between the text property of this text block and the active nodes property of or, or active node type. Sorry, of our view model. So when one updates and we raise the property change, the view I will update and show that text. And then actually, so this is like the top level. This is back all the way up in our extension now um, in the loaded method. So now that we've implemented the data and the UI, um, we need to actually instantiate this stuff. So at the very top in the loaded example, we have this. Um, we build a new uh, menu item. Uh, with just 
uh, this is a, another WPF control. Um, give it some header, which will be the text that shows up. And it could be more complicated than that. You could put icons in it or, or um, you know, images and stuff like that. But here it's just some text. And then on click, we have some function that runs. And the function instantiates this sample window view model, uh, which is the view model that we have been building. And then use the uh, send in the parameters. So these are the loaded uh, parameters for, that the extension gives us from up here. Instantiate our new control, which is the sample window, and then uh, set the data context uh, to the view model that we just built. So built the view model, set the data context so that that active node types property means something. Um, and then we also set the owner of the window uh, to the Dynamo window. So this is useful for like if you close the window, you want both to close. Um, other, uh, I think if you minimize it, maybe it will minimize that other window as well if the owner is set correctly, things like that. Um, and then here, just manually setting the position uh, of the window and moving it relative to the owner's position when it opens up. And then finally show it. And then the last thing that we do is we call this add menu item uh, like utility function which is, in, is also passed down in the um, view loaded params. And there, there's a, just a, it's, this one's pretty simple. Uh, this API lets you pick one of the Dynamo views that, or the Dynamo menus that already exists. You can add your menu item to an existing menu. Um, and then you just tell it what menu uh, you want to add it to, and then also the menu item that you want to add. Um, you can also do things like add separators, like if you want your uh, menu item to show up in a totally like, sub menu or something. Uh, you have that control. And then the last two steps are to now go and add some uh, XML file to the project. So you can do that through Visual Studio. And then you want to add something that looks similar to this, just depending on where you're going to place your final DLLs. And basically, and depending on what the namespace and class name was for your type. So the assembly name is pointing to the sample view extension. And the type name is, I think, here we had the same namespace as the name of the class. So it's sample view extension, sample view extension. And then the this uh, outer element depends on if it's a extension or view extension also. So this should be view extension definition or just extension definition, depending on what type you're, you're building. Um, and <clears throat> then you want to copy those to wherever Dynamo is. If, if it's a local build that you're building, or if it's an installed version of Dynamo, you would copy those into, this is like the, if you're building from source for, from Dynamo, uh, you put it in, you know, debug or release, wherever, uh, wherever it's building. Inside of view extensions, you put that uh, view extension definition XML file, and then you would put your sample view extension .dll, the actual DLL for that thing, uh, just under debug. and. Uh, that could be changed depending on what you put here in the relative path pointing to the assembly path. So that, that should be straightforward. It's just when it loads, you know, where does it go to load the DLL? And when it goes and finds that DLL, what does it try to instantiate inside that DLL is basically what's in this file. And then this thing should show up. You should get something added to the bottom of the view menu, which is where we put the menu item. And then this thing uh, should show up kind of offset from the center of this window. And then I've just got some kind of smaller API samples around um, kind of just like one-off little things that I think are not obvious parts of our API, which might be uh, useful. And I can totally share this. Uh, I'll post this uh, link to this this presentation on, uh, on the Slack um, so you guys can check it out or copy things out of here. Because um, uh, I know none of, you know, all that stuff not going to be, it's pretty hard to just like remember. So, uh, but the things that I think are are useful to check out um, is this, or, or maybe not, things that are not obvious from looking at the API on the extensions level is the command executive dot execute command. Um, you have to pass it a command, but what is that and where do those live? So you can build them by using uh, their, on the Dynamo model, I believe they're, they're static, um, uh, I think they're, they're static uh, object or static constructors, I believe, on the Dynamo model that you can just build. So for instance, this command uh, 
the force run cancel command, the appropriately named, is a uh, lets you run the graph or cancel it. Um, so this can be used for either of those. And there's some there's some properties here that you pass. Uh, I believe one of them is so these these should be documented since they're public uh, methods. But they um, I think one of these lets you uh, run or cancel, and the other one lets you suppress errors from the run, something like that. But so you can do things, you know, like in the middle of your extension when somebody presses a button, or when you want, you know, when somebody pressed next in a debugger or something, you run the graph again, or something like that, or run part of the graph. Uh, and then you also provide, when you execute a command, you provide your unique ID and your name, uh, so that there's a log of who is at what extension is executing that command. Um, and then the place to look at this and see all of these commands is in the Dynamo source. You can look at uh, Dynamo Core Models Recordable Commands. That's yes. And that, I mean, it would be better if we had some like some you know nice documentation around that. And there is a there is like an auto generated uh, to Dynamo Core API site. Um, but I think it would probably just be useful to check out that um, that file. Um, and I don't have a link for the API uh, auto gen stuff, but Rissell, we can put it on the Slack, right? Yeah, it's you... on the wiki. Okay. It's on the Dynamo, Dynamo Core wiki. So that, that's kind of nice for this because it might be useful for this session because that's like a that's a searchable auto generated uh, thing. So it might be a little bit easier than like rummaging through the giant repo. So I, I'll get that link up. Um, and then the. The other thing is that you can also run view model commands, uh, which are accessed a little bit differently and uh, have more powers. So these are things you want to do to the view, um, which aren't really exposed nicely through the uh, extensions framework yet. So what you have to do is uh, what I was showing before, where you get the Dynamo window and then you get the data context for that, which is going to be set as the Dynamo view model. And from there, you can uh, either run things on the view model or I think more interestingly you can run things on the workspace view model. You can execute commands on the workspace so you can tell, uh, make it do things like reset the view uh, zoom level or pan um, or rotate the camera or things like that. Add things to selection, um, just any, any kind of UI interaction that we would have through the UI you can also execute uh, from the extension. Um, and then there's one other thing I thought would be uh, interesting to people. It's just how would you go about with an extension doing something like um, injecting some UI into other parts of the application? So for instance, like how would you add some new text to every node or add a button to existing nodes so that you don't need to write a U new UI node? So one one feature request that we've had forever um, and we've never had time to implement is like I want a button that will run this node or I want a way I want a way to, uh, to run from this spot or I want to delete element binding on this node or from any node but we don't you know I don't think that that's something we're gonna do right now but someone could imp and also we don't want to change the base UI of nodes to add this extra button, let's say, right? It's just not on the on our, our like roadmap at this point, whatever whatever that whatever that feature uh, is. But an extension has access to the view, so it could potentially like add lots of functionality. So this is just an example of um, how you could get access to the existing node views and inject some text. So here it's just injecting um, uh, the the real like the real name. Of the of that exact node that's going to be run into the node, and not uh, you know not a final UX UI here definitely, um, but you could imagine this is like a another a whole another property that gets added to nodes that your extension adds, right? So we have like you know preview state of the node like is it on is it frozen anything like that? But you could add other properties to the node. You could add new <clears throat> a new menu item to the checkbox or to the uh, right-click menu of the selection on the node. So um, things like drop element binding data or run from here or something like that could be uh, potentially added and injected into existing UI like this. 
Um, so then, how's that done? So, note the warning. This is like hack. I was like writing last night. Um, definitely, there's like performance implication to this code, but there's going to be a nicer way to do this. And if there isn't, we should add one. Um, so just you know, beware. Don't do exactly what I'm doing here. But the idea is that you can get access to these views and change them. So uh, basically, when the window gets re-rendered, um, so I'm looking at uh, the loaded parameters, again, the view loaded parameters, looking at the Dynamo window, and then looking at layout updated, which is a WPF event that exists on all uh, windows, I think, maybe even all framework elements. And then I have this method that runs, Dynamo window content rendered. And when it, when it runs, we look at, uh, do some, another thing that's a little hacky, we look at the Dynamo window and we, because WPF stores all the elements as a tree, we could actually just iterate the whole tree. So there's no real nice way to go just like get the node views from our system, probably because someone decided it would be bad to be able to do that. But you can look them up. So uh, you can find all the visual children, all the, all the framework elements, um, that are node views of, of that type. Um, then once you have access to those, uh, they all have this thing called an input grid, which is like the main grid where all the Dynamo uh, extra kind of customized UI goes usually. So you can access that input grid and then you can put stuff in there. So here we're just adding a text block with the text set to the creation name, which is like the real name of the node. Um, so it won't change when a user changes the name of the node. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Maybe it's something that we should incorporate into the actual node UI. So maybe someone wants to, not, you know, you want to still know the name of the real name of the node, even when a user's changed, like the the user facing name, the display name. And then you just add that to the input grid children. Um, so that that's just like an idea, and I'm sure there's a better way to do this, um, or sh or should be. And if anyone wants to look at that code. Uh, it's at this link. It's in my fork of the Dynamo samples repo on this extensions workshop uh, branch. And I'll up, once I finish this up, I will drop this into Slack so you can use these links. Okay, and then I'm almost done. Um, last thing is uh, kind of incoming uh, changes. So these are things that we are working on right now, and some of you might have. Notice some, some people are mentioning, talking to me about this PR. So we're investigating. Um, uh, so, so stepping back a sec. So right now, you build this extension. You do all this work. Uh, you learn about all these APIs. You build something really cool. And then you have to tell users to go and add it to a folder in their Dynamo installation directory somewhere. And they have to name this XML file the right thing. And they have to put that in the right spot if you ever update your extension and you have to have give it to them again and yada yada or you have to write an installer which is no fun um, so we're investigating uh, putting uh, ex having the package manager load extensions um, and and be in charge of distribution of extensions um, as one way to do it so that would mean that uh, packages could contain multiple extensions they could contain view extensions or um, or model extensions I don't know what, when this work will get in, um, or if it will, um, but it, it, it seems pretty interesting. The loading sequence might change a bit, so I just wanted to mention this because we just went over all this information, and I know some of it might be getting tweaked a little bit. Um, so the, the loading sequence might change of those uh, of those kind of uh, lifecycle events. Uh, probably not. Hopefully, hopefully not. And there might be some more added. Um, another thing is loaded parameters. Uh, will also likely contain a reference to the startup parameters. And that's because if you load, if some user loads a package uh, later, after Dynamo startup time, there will be no startup event because Dynamo has already started at that point. So we don't want uh, users to miss, or you know, uh, extensions developers to miss those uh, properties. You know, like things like the auth provider or the uh, library loader. They're just stuff that um, uh, is, it could be important. And that way you won't have like broken extensions that only work if they're loaded in a certain way. So the API might change a little bit, just adding stuff, not getting rid of anything there. Um, but it would be really good to know now or soon, before the 2.0 release, if we do this package manager work for 2.0, uh, what APIs 
you know, are getting in the way for you or of something you're trying to build, um, what's missing, you know, from, from these extension APIs, um, because then potentially we could make sure it works with this, the way the package manager could load it and also maybe actually get it in uh, for 2.0 potentially. Uh, no promises, but it would be, it would be uh, very informative uh, to know since we're doing this push and we want to make these as useful as possible. Um, and it's, uh, it'd be pretty, pretty cool to see new functionality developed on top of the extensions framework that's, you know, distributed to people through the package manager, um, without having to write custom installers. And, uh, and the last thing to say here is that, uh, because it's on the package manager, you, your extension could also be removed, right? If somebody uninstalls the package at runtime. So you have to be thinking about what, what will happen if someone removes my, uh, removes this extension. So that's why like the dispose and, and shut down uh, becomes important. Removes it, adds it back, removes it, adds it back. Like it, it, it's important to, to think about to, uh, memory and, and things like that there. Um, and then last, I just had some kind of off the cuff project ideas. Um, everyone that you know uh, applied had some, some cool ideas. I just thought I'd share a couple of my own, which is just you know tracking graph changes um, by watching the workspace. Um, collection modified events, maybe tying those with the auth provider to like know who is doing it. So you could potentially ask the auth provider who is logged in and then use that and track who's making these changes to the graph, something like that. Um, an extension that finds missing dependencies, like finds what packages are in the graph and then reports those uh, and maybe ties that to the, embeds that in the, in the file somehow or uh, generates a report of like, or maybe just pops it up on the screen, maybe goes and downloads it from the package manager for you um, if you're missing some package that's currently in there. Um, write your own graph UI. So uh, just improve upon what's there or modify the node UI um, or write a totally different UI, a textual UI. You can do things like continuously convert the whole graph to design script through node to code and then display it. Uh, side by side, so you could get like a live update of all the DS. Um, an execution results view, some different way of represent. This was kind of something that I think got asked at the user group last night. It was like we display results in preview bubbles, but like and in background preview. But what other ways could we display results of graph execution? There's probably all sorts of interesting visualizations that we could do that someone could hook up uh, and generate. You know, have multiple. Uh, extensions that are showing different views of that data. Like maybe you click on a node and you get a different representation of its of its preview bubble values. Um, a minimap, uh, inject UI into the base node view, we, that one I showed, and then just uh, improve our sad background preview is another one. Like rendering, shadows, you know, uh, totally replace it, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's, that's it. Now it is your turn. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, ramble on for a while, and I hope you hope that was useful. Hope you enjoyed it. You, the end. Um, and we can also totally open to any questions that you guys have got now, or maybe and or throughout the day. I'll, I'll kick off with one with the the change to the JSON file format. Are you guys going to change the preferences XML and maybe these manifests to JSON as well? It would make sense to me if they were. Um, it makes sense to me, uh, but you got to talk to yourself because I think we, I think we nixed that. We, yeah, pretty well. We yeah. are low on time, oh. and for right now, they are going to remain XML. It's we could potentially change it in a dot release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe into We could load. We could, right yeah, in the future we could load both because they're simple enough. Yeah, and maybe in terms of um, APIs, just one idea I have while watching the presentation was um, work with WordPress quite a bit, and the way they handle um, subscribing to events and, and things is quite interesting. So, for example, if I make an extension and uh, let's say Mateo makes an extension, we, our users both install it. There's no way to control which one gets loaded first. Um, in WordPress, they handled that with a, a kind of integer as a priority. As in, you say, my my thing is a priority 10, it gets loaded at 10. 
uh, and then someone else can say, oh, it's a 90 priority, it gets loaded later on. So I don't know, maybe um, some kind of mechanism to, to say which one gets loaded first, otherwise there's no way to ensure that. Do you mean when the extension gets loaded or yeah. when it gets its events called before other extensions? Uh, essentially, that when Dynamo calls the, the, the startup methods on each of the extensions. Gotcha. Yeah, I presume it just collects them. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it collects them. In. Yeah, it's just a .NET. Yeah. You know, whatever the uh, event subscription uh, yeah. mechanism is. So yeah, we. I mean, we could, we could use one of the other patterns there instead to yeah. add priority. If that, do you think that that what would be the use case? Do you think? If you have a dependency on another one, so for example, mm -hmm. if I write a model extension um, that does something, and then I have another model extension that. Relies Depends on, on the that previous one. one being executed first, for example. Yeah. Probably not good design to do it that way, but. Um, no, something we should. I mean, yeah. That, I mean, it's pretty interesting. Like things like that will come up maybe immediately. I'm not yeah. sure. But yeah, that's. Or for example, I read an extension that wants to track what other extensions are installed. Yep. If I mine executes first, it'll say nothing. If it executes last, then it'll say, oh, I don't these ones are right. Interesting. Because analytics is one of the kind of big, big ones. Yes, not silence all around. Yeah. Should we? Uh, should we whiteboard who wants to work on what maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah? Alright, let's turn the thing into a and I don't know, maybe we'll start writing topics about what you guys want to be working on and see if there's some natural clusters.